So it's been a minute since we watched some some Greg, and he's done consecutive like videos of his conspiracy stuff. Did we not watch Poly Polybius? Did this game exist? Is he doing a? Is this a Mandela effect? We didn't watch this one. This one doesn't seem. I don't know. Maybe we can watch it. Uh, why does it say I watched this? I didn't. Oops. I just clicked off it. So I guess. I guess we'll just. <laughs> maybe it's because I had it paused here. Um. So this is UFO or Russian spy from Greg Armor Skeptic. It is just a coincidence that I'm also doing a shoe on head video today, but I do think it's funny. Uh, Falcon Lake incident. He has been deeply conspiratorial. We'll see if he can skeptic his way out of it. Don't waste your time with the game one. Just, just boring. All right. Uh, well, this isn't memes. He mean, he means it. UFO Russian spy, man. I, I can't tell. I don't know which way I want him to go. I like. I guess as a person, just for hoping for the best, I hope, I hope the, uh, thank you, Manic. Uh, I hope the, uh, like, conspiratorial thinking sort of dies out and he gets some help. But also, it's deeply interesting, his sort of theory, his grand unifying theory on this. Um, <laughs> a shoe react to the other transphobic movie sounds shitty and I want her to be at work first because she's trans. Oh, yeah, I see. Thank you, yeah. Appreciate the biddies. All right. This go. is a real silver coin created by the Canadian Mint in 2018, depicting the strangest and most iconic UFO case in Canadian history that we call the Falcon Lake Incident. Oh, and the coin glows in the dark. <laughs> the story cool. from the Falcon Lake Incident really does deserve to be commemorated with such a bizarre coin because it's the most unique UFO story to ever be recorded on Earth. And most importantly, this case left behind real physical evidence as well as a mysterious injury on the eyewitness. Skeptical. On May 20th, 1967, in White Shell Provincial Park, Manitoba, Stephen McCallick was searching for silver and other gems stones around Falcon Lake. He thought that he heard a motor running, so he followed the sound until he found two identical cigar-shaped objects maneuvering. Are these cigar-shaped? That's a tube, right? Maneuvering through the air above him. One of the craft landed nearby, apparently shape-shifting into a more conventional UFO design. Steven's drawing of the craft appears to depict a saucer with some kind of grid pattern along the bottom surface. Uh, we have a pressed penny, therefore aliens. I had one of Shamu. I had a Shamu one. As the first craft landed on the shoreline, the second craft flew away. Steven walked towards the landed craft, trying to get the attention of the crew, offering to help Weasley. Thanks for following, dude. them with repairs as he assumed that they were experiencing some sort of a mechanical failure. As he got closer to the saucer, he started to notice a sulfur smell, and he began to be blinded by the craft's lights. He could hear- This sounds like the kind of thing an ancient aliens guy would make up so that he could say it smelled like sulfur that must be what the old the ancients thought demons were you know <laughs> hear voices coming from inside the object but when he looked he could only he see a cigar cutter he said cigar shaped instrument panels but he couldn't find any people he tried speaking to the crew in english polish german and russian which made the voices go silent. Steven described the saucer as being perfectly smooth with no visible weld marks or rivets. And wanting to admire the craftsmanship, he decided to run his hand across the surface, which immediately made his glove melt. And that's the melted glove. This is this is an example of a glove that's melted. You mean like here, right here? This looks like he touched his fingertips to a hot thing. If and like, 
As he stepped back, part of the saucer began to spin, and before he could get out of its way, some form of exhaust or thruster jet blasted out of one of the grid panels on the lower surface of the craft, which nailed him in the chest, blasting him to the ground. The thruster burned straight through his shirts, leaving an injury on his chest in the shape of that grid. He hmm. Hmm. Immediately. Uh, he said they were cigar shaped and then shape shifted into a more traditional UFO shape. Yeah. Immediately ripped off his burning shirt and left it on the ground with the rest of his gear as he decided to leave. As Stephen hiked back to his hotel, he became very ill with disorientation and upset stomach. As he returned home to his city of Winnipeg to seek medical attention, his symptoms only got worse. He experienced severe headaches, weight loss, an inability to digest food, and the pain on his chest from the wound was so intense he could rarely wear a shirt regularly displaying his wounds. Uh, sounds like he was standing on a gas vent, which would explain the melted glove and blinding, also the hallucinations and exhaust and illness. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. Naturally, there was a healthy amount of skepticism about this story. Kind of just sounds like the guy made it up. But the RCMP investigated the site and they found a good deal of sketchy evidence where Stephen claimed to find the UFO. Most notably, they found a decent sized piece of metal. <laughs> they used a tuning to show you the relative size. Hey, anybody got a toonie on? <laughs> that was like Chicago for some reason. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Anybody got a toonie? that had been melted and settled between See, they have loonies and toonies. Between the rocks of the shore, the police collected the burned glove that McCallick dropped, his charred shirt with the matching grid pattern on the chest, as well as some soil samples from the area. The craziest part is that several of the items that the RCMP brought back from that site were radioactive, including Stephen's glove. In the end, the RCMP was never able to come up with a conclusion, and the investigation was left unresolved. Was this UFO story spin to cover up something more nefarious? Was this another Cold War lie? Or a genuine visitation from aliens? What exactly did Stephen McCallick encounter on Falcon Lake in 1967? He hasn't been wacky in this one yet. I know it seemed like I was done covering UFO stories, but I got thinking about them again with all this buzz about disclosure. I am not convinced that every single bizarre incident involving unidentified aerial phenomenon can be blamed on aliens. But something happened to Stephen McCallick in Falcon Lake. Something left him with some form of radiation sickness back in 1967. Are we sure it was radiation sickness? And clearly something left behind radiation in White Shell Provincial Park. A few no, he does a vocal fry thing that we all find after watching a lot of this uh, very off-putting because he... I have a history with Greg. <laughs> uh, and he's he's just always been like a deeply sort of like fake guy. And he's going through this like conspiracy theory phase and the vocal fry is only getting worse you know he sounds so cool and then sometimes we watch a video where he sings really earnestly and it doesn't work at all um but if it's not grating to you that is delightful for you uh um I hope that maintains over the course of time for you. I hope you like it. A few years ago, I released a video debunking military whistleblowers that claimed to witness naval encounters with UFOs, as well as a man that claimed to work for the Pentagon's UFO department. And though I usually like to debunk stories like this, there are a handful of really interesting UFO stories out of Canada that have always managed to elude my skepticism.
I'm not saying that I believe that it's aliens. No, 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 no. But I do believe Good. that some of the elements of these stories are true. And the eyewitnesses were almost certainly not lying about what they saw. Stephen McCallick was 51 years old at the time of this incident. But he didn't spend his entire life in Canada. He was actually born in Poland on August 7th of 1916. He enlisted in the Polish army before World War II, getting to the rank of junior officer. And then during the war, he actually fought with a partisan group of soldiers that were described as participating in clandestined operations. And Stephen was separated from his family when he moved to Canada. It actually took him about 10 years of fighting to reunite with them on Canadian soil. So Stephen wasn't just to be lying to be delusional. That's true. Some random guy. He'd been around. The media went crazy with this incident, blasting a story that claimed Stephen McCallick was attacked by aliens. <clears throat> oh, look, it's Mothman. Similar to the Mothman incident, the He's media so got ahead of this event by overwhelming the public with supernatural explanations. That's something that has still not changed to this day. So we should all likely disagree with the alien theory that was prevalent in the media at the time, right? Do any of you believe in aliens? But something happened that- I believe that- life forms exist in the universe that aren't humans or earthlings uh but no that they have visited no i do not i don't think there's any there's just no evidence for it. the fermi paradox is is holding true it sucks i wish i wish we had uh like alien visitors dude i think it would do a couple things um well not right now like Back in the day, pro preferably before nukes, but, you know, of course not. Uh, this does seem to have a lot to do with this, the Cold War, though. There, a lot of them, a lot of things happened between the 40s and the 80s, the late 80s. Falcon Lake. The melted steel is maybe the most suspicious part because steel needs to be heated to about 1500 degrees Celsius to melt, and the average jet engine was about 800 or 900 degrees back then, meaning that if that melted steel is related to that blast that came out of the UFO, then that means that could not- it was fucking that hot, his chest would be way more fucked up than it was. Not have been a conventional jet engine. Stephen McCallick apparently was also an alcoholic, when the RCMP interviewed him, they recorded that he did not smell like alcohol, but he did have the general appearance of someone that overindulges. Uh, that's not really great news for the credibility of his story. But Stephen also underwent a psychological test, and they found that he was a very pragmatic thinker and not likely the type to make up stories. That fry is frying. Oh, yeah. When I like to deliver information, I like to do it from down here. Okay? I mean, more like this. That's sort of that's sort of like the the thing you got to do though, right? I think you gotta, I hope you very have a you fantastic day. Up. Superhero. Thank you for subscribing. 34 months. So it makes it very unlikely that this is just some hoax that Steven spun up to get attention. But that still doesn't mean that I think his story is true, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Steven maintained his story until the day he died, insisting that the- So 1500 degrees from pretty fucking far away, it looks like. This doesn't look like the burns of someone who got hit with something. Um just devastatingly hot like that uh steel wasn't it wasn't liquefied it was you know a little a little bendy bendy on the outside i guess uh but you know we've been melting steel for thousands of years there's many ways to get heat that hot <laughs> uh we'll see you could you could literally just have it sit in coals for a while and it would happen um this is not i don't even know what would make that shape of a wound uh but i bet if you did some research on all the different um pieces and parts that were around in canada during that time 
it would not shock me to find that he was like somewhere he shouldn't have been made up a story. <laughs> the incident a truck would do it. Uh, like the exhaust. I, I don't know was real, and it happened exactly as he described. But unlike the media, he didn't believe that the craft was extraterrestrial. Instead, Stephen believed he encountered some kind of secret government technology, a top-secret military flying craft. Canadian Several technology? of the details of this story really remind me of the Cash Landrum incident in 1980 in Dayton, Texas. Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and her grandson Colby were driving home in an Oldsmobile Cutlass around 9 p.m. I had one of those. When a large diamond-shaped craft started hovering across their path on the road. This UFO was about the size of a water tower, and most importantly... This look... Uh, in fucking Texas? This looks like an early version of like a shuttle return craft. It was ejecting some kind of a flame downwards towards right. the ground. The Landrum like told Cash to stop the car craft. because she was worried that like they'd get burned era. if they got any closer. But she also thought that it was some kind of sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Of she, she said, quote, that's Jesus. He will not hurt us. Uh, sorry, doll, that wasn't Jesus. Apparently, they... St Ooh, way to keep it for some reason. He, he does weird cuts like that, and I don't know why. Uh, sorry, doll, that wasn't Jesus. Sorry, uh doll. <laughs> I agree with him, and it's still weird how he delivers that, man. This is not that objectionable of a video, though. I don't think it's a YouTuber, uh, to be honest. Like, I don't really think there's anything here. This is just interesting, though. <laughs> Apparently, they unless still he says got something. Unless he says something else coming up, but he seems to be back on. He he's he seems to be trying to not sound conspiratorial. Too close, as the heat from the flame Dull, yes. melted parts of the car and made the metal too hot to touch. One of the ladies even developed welts on her skin. Whatever this craft was, it also was most certainly radioactive because Betty Cash fell victim to radiation sickness and lost significant portions of her hair. Yeah. As the UFO left the scene, it was followed by several black helicopters. Remain skeptical. I. It's hard to read this. Okay, so I find the detail of the UFO shape-shifting from a cigar to a disc as it's landing really frustrating. Uh, I, I don't. I don't believe that part of the story at all. There are several parts of the story that seem totally fabricated, though. I want. I'm interested in why that's the part that you think is fabricated. I think it could be mistaken. But also there are flying like if you if your theory is if your skepticism is like, okay, what if this is just like a craft uh is like Cold War technology either from apparently Russia or Canada or the US? Um I mean you can make a you can make a like he mistook the shape argument, I guess. I want to believe McCallick's story, I want to show faith in people's testimonies, but there's something really sketchy about the way he communicated a few of the details. I hate to do this, but I have to ask, what if it is important that Stephen McCallick is foreign, and he's some kind of an Eastern spy? What if he went to Falcon Lake with the express purpose of interacting with some kind of spy equipment and it accidentally blasted him in the chest? I mean, think about it. He literally admitted to speaking to the UFO in Russian. Or what if this whole thing was a cover story designed as an alibi to explain some other operation that he was doing in Canada? Falcon Lake is right next to the border with Ontario. Between 1950 and 1980, the RCMP was spying on Canadians as part of Project Profunk. Tro Project is a thing we need to get rid of in the Canadian lexicon. 
trying to find Canadians with ties to the Soviets or to communist extremist groups. So they did that in the U.S. at the same time, like McCarthyism and stuff. By the way, this is why we don't have a rich history of leftists um, after this era and up until, like, now. is because the government, like, literally tried to root them out. Like, the next, the next like, leftist things are, like, the Black Panthers and stuff, and they get, you know, eviscerated by the FBI, CIA. You say communists? Uh, yes. In fact, everyone arrested under that directive was sent to various camps across Canada in provincial and national parks. Thousands of Canadians were sent to these camps during this time. According to Wikipedia, the goal of the program was to allow for quick internment of known and suspected communist sympathizers in the event of a war with the Soviet Union and its allies. Mm -hmm. I bet you didn't know that. Like I said, mm, I didn't know it about, I don't, I don't uh, sorry, uh, I was self-absorbed with American, America's history of like the same practice. Uh, they did essentially the same thing. They used market pressure for a lot of these. They'd keep people out of work. You're like, oh, there's tons of actors and stuff and scientists. and um, I mean, just tons of people throughout society that, you know, had real links to communism or very, uh, uh, not so real links to communists. Twas bad. Said there were several of these facilities. Men and women were separated into separate camps and eventually would get filtered into various penitentiaries across Canada. The children were sent to Joyceville, Ontario, just down the road from me. And the Children's Aid Society was able to find homes and institutions for all of them to live. They called these the red diaper babies. They would literally separate families and steal their babies. The Children's Aid Society would aid in stealing children. Awesome. The RCMP have a headquarters. Every time he makes content, it's like, Greg, you should just be a leftist. <laughs> like, just be a leftist. And you'll be like, oh. Oh, I don't have to. It's not a conspiracy. Just real. Wait till he finds out about residential schools. I'm assuming he'd be like, I know about residential schools. There's only about 20 minutes away from Falcon Lake. So it's possible that Stephen McCallick was undergoing some kind of operation against the RCMP themselves. Mm -hmm. But I don't think so. Maybe video. there was some other kind of secret military facility or a point of interest hidden away in the woods somewhere. It's impossible to say. But what do you guys think? Was Stephen McCallick a secret Sweet. Soviet spy conducting espionage here on Canadian soil? Was he just a hoaxer that was spinning up a story to get famous? Or did he really encounter aliens on that fateful day back in 1967? Let me know, because I am so confused. Uh, that might be like the least interesting one he's done in a while. He didn't actually have much to say about this. It felt more like I should put a video out type content. Like he's he, he went through a little bit of a lull and he wasn't really uploading a lot. And then he's been trying to do multiple per month. I think four a month. One a week, maybe. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, but yeah, this was this was actually... His History is a Lie series is the best. Why does it have a little notch in it now this is new what's happening oh god oh god it means something there's a symbol there's a symbol his right eye is crossed now what's it mean it's joker The green man got attacked, yet shall preserve. Dude. We've watched so many. We've watched all of these. 
I've never been an avid YouTube viewer of anybody until I streamed them. <laughs>